Hello, and welcome to the fifth episode of the Slide Rule Pass podcast, your weekly football podcast brought to you from the makers of Slide Rule Pass blog. In this episode, we're going to take a close look at what's been going on with our sides in Club Corner, catch up on all the weekly results and talking points from the Premier League this week, and give our take on who's the best Premier League striker ever. It's been raging in the media, and we want to have our say on that as well. And we're also going to pick our team of the season so far. I'm your host, Chris, and as usual, I'm joined by my old mucker, Mark. How are you, mate? I'm good, thanks, mate. How's things going? Yeah, not so bad at all, mate. Not so bad at all. Been a, been a bit of a, another funny week, uh, which we're going to get on to in a second, mate, in Club Corner. Uh, a weird week for me when I've been probably wanting your team to win even more than mine. But uh, what do you say, mate? Should we take a trip in the Club Corner? Let's get going. Let's get ourselves away there, mate. Okay, so it's time for Club Corner. This is the part of the show where Mark and myself go through what's been happening with our teams. Uh, but anyone who doesn't know that, my team is Newcastle and uh, Mark's is Aston Villa. And weirdly enough, we were deeply intertwined this week, mate, <laughs> with the two fixtures that we had on, on the cards. Um, starting off with, uh, with the mighty magpies, Steve Bruce's black and white army, Blech, um, taking on Spurs at St. James's Park. Now, for most people looking on, myself as a Newcastle fan, we thought nothing other than just a severe loss, really, here. We were expecting 3-0, 4-0, 5-0. That's all some people predicting. Uh, weirdly enough, we managed to get a point. But, you know, that, that kind of doesn't tell all the story, really, about the game. I mean, you know, a point on the surface looks fantastic, but it was almost copy and paste, you know, for Newcastle. We, You know, you, you could say the same thing about the game against Crystal Palace, the game against Leeds, the game against Villa, the game against Wolves. Started very well. You know, looked like we should have been two or three nil up. Um, you know, Gale has a good chance, a good save from Maurice. Um, Joe Linton, uh, you know, that, you don't check the recording, everybody. I did say Joe Linton scored a goal um, and quite a good goal. <laughs> and that put us in front. And and then we just kind of drifted away again, mate, kind of lost the game. You know, Harry Kane being the player that he is, I think if Spurs don't have Harry Kane, they possibly don't get a point in that game. Likewise, if we had Wilson playing, we, we might get three. But, you know, for me, it's yes, it was a big point, but I, I still look at it as two points lost because I don't really think we would have had a better chance of beating Spurs than, than we did on Sunday. What was your take on it? I think you're right. I, I think it, Spurs are funny. They're, they've been, I mean, they're very hit and miss at times, but they, they've been so, so poor lately. Um, mm. Certainly, to to start with, the against Newcastle, they were they were they were awful to start with. Newcastle <laughs> deserved their, their lead, um, and and yes, Joe Linton scored, which was I think <laughs> woke everybody up yesterday. Um, and yeah, it was it was odd because he, I think we all went into it thinking, well, this is going to be two two or three nil maybe, mm. uh, and Newcastle came out of the traps flying and. And then just went to sleep, and the defending for the for the first goal was was abysmal. Um, oh God, Neil Craft, Neil Craft. I've, I've, uh, I've seen better defending pub team football where where the defender didn't get until four o'clock in the morning. Honestly, and we played at nine. <laughs> I think that was awful. the defender to be. <laughs> you know, it, it was just it it was so so poor. Um, oh. And and how he's just allowed to, to just I can't even remember, picture the the ball just bobbling into his feet two yards from the goal. He's oh he's man, a miss. The second one, you know, it's it's a, it is a great finish. It's a it's a Harry Kane esque finish, that isn't it? And you, you give him too, too much too much time though, too much space absolutely. and too much time. Yeah. The defending was criminal, really. I mean, you know, Paul Dummett had a decent game, I thought. Okay, but, but when you look at the goal. You know, he's, he's reading the game. I don't know if that's rust, uh, mate, but it, you know, you just you don't leave a guy like that that much space. You know, you just don't do that. You know, it's you too can't. clinical. No, too uh, clinical. The, the one the one striker in the league you do not give that space to is Harry Kane, and, and they gave him all the all the time in the world just to bury that in the corner. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but it, it was a funny one, mate. It was a funny one because you know you, you kind of look at you look at that game and you look at the two managers. You know who who it must be said. Both of those managers are, are the next favourites to be sacked <laughs> for very different <laughs> reasons. <laughs> when you when you look at Spurs, I mean, if I was a Spurs fan and I'm watching that game yesterday, I'm thinking, what the hell am my team doing? You know, Steve Bruce made 
five changes for a Premier League team. Five changes. That's the kind of changes you make for you know Halifax Town in the FA Cup third round or something. Not a Premier League game when you're fighting for your lives. But you know, I, I'm not gonna. I, I don't want to give him any credit really. But you know, credit to the players who came in. You know, I think Matt Ritchie, Longstaff, and Murphy in particular. They haven't played since January, and you look at them, and they were head and shoulders above. You know the guys that they replaced against Brighton. You know how, how did you think those guys sl- slot in, mate? Well, I think it was it was telling. I mean, the the Brighton performance was so bad, and and I, and I hate to give the man credit, but but Steve Bruce made those changes, and mm. you know you you give him grief when things go wrong, and we absolutely do that. He he made the changes. You know, yes that. You can't bring in the main men. They're still not ready, and they're going to be shoe ins to come back in as soon as they're fit. Yeah, but it, but you know the the guys that came in. I thought Longstaff played well again. You know, a little bit of rust, but you've just said that he hasn't played since January. Um, and I think they all acquitted themselves really, really well. Um, you know that they, they had their moment of of Newcastleness. You know, let, letting that lead go, and but but they, they they fought on, and you know when you look at the look at the stats from the game, twenty two shots. I can't remember the last time Newcastle had twenty two shots in a game. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we've had, I don't think we've had twenty two shots in half a season, mate. To be honest with you, it kind of seems that way, doesn't it? But uh, I mean, yeah, there were some great chances. I mean, there was chances that really people should have put away as well. I mean, you know, the Gale one in particular, you know, with. With a header, you know, it got to be said, great ball by Shelby. I know I run Shelby down, but that was one of his better moments. That little, you know, kind of flick ball around the side. Um, great movement by Gale, but again, it's rustiness. He's in, he's out. He's like the hokey cokey in this team. You know, he's he, he, he's not got enough time to settle. But you know, he, he hits the header. Great save by Luis. But Luis shouldn't know anything about the rebound. He should just melt that in the back of the net. If you look at Joe Willock's equaliser, that's what Gale should have done on that chance. You know, it, 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 it were poles apart. You know, and that's a young twenty odd year old lad from from Arsenal yeah. to a you know a thirty year old you know experienced striker who is you know reported to get a three year contract extension. But I mean, I mean, there, there, there was bits of the game I was quite happy with, you know, impressed with. I think just a special mention for Jacob Murphy because I think what he lacks in ability, he, he, he kind of makes up for in bravery because he's he's not scared to take a man on, and, and Newcastle need that kind of player. Yeah, absolutely. You need somebody just to, in fact, you know, most of the team just to to play now without without fear, mm. and, and just play, you know, hearts on the sleeve. Just just get back, battle now until the end of the season because it's going to be one. Um, you know, it's a it's a point. It is a point gained. It's one that I don't think many people saw coming. It should have been three. The frustrating thing for Newcastle fans is that it should have been three. It should um, have been, yeah. You know, I think on on another day, and and you you hit the nail on the head earlier on. That if Wilson plays, I think that that ends up being a a win. So that's yeah. But you take the point, and and it, you know it's a it, it was a point that left you clinging on a little bit later on in the day. Um, mm. it's uh, it is a point at the end of the day, so you know, take it, move on. There are there are big games coming. Well, speaking of those big games coming, you're right. It, it is a point, you know, and we should be happy that it is a point. Um, it would have meant nothing if um, Aston Villa couldn't beat Fulham, which we'll come on to in a second. But just looking at the rest of the fixtures, kind of moving forward. So, you know, after this game, Castle have Burnley away um, next weekend, next Sunday. And that's that's you know that's no no easy fixture. You know Burnley are quite a hard team, and they can grit it out. Yes, we beat them last time, but they're not say we're going to do it again. Then we've we've got West Ham at St James, which is normally a home banker. But I mean these guys are chasing Champions League for God's sake. You know that they're, they're on fire at the moment. And then this is where it gets real for Newcastle. You've got Liverpool away, Arsenal at home. You got Leicester away, Man City at home, back to back. Now. As I mentioned at the start, there was no better chance to get points off one of those big teams than on Sunday, and we blew it again. Whether you like to admit it or not, we blew it again. No, uh, you, you're absolutely right. That that run now is is just such a tough run. You you look, 
obviously Burnley are, are fighting now as well because they're sort of getting sucked into it. Mm. They're at home. You've then, you know, West Ham have won again tonight. Um, you've got you've got Liverpool who seem to be back in back in form. You've got an up and down Arsenal team. Um Leicester City. But, it's just but, yeah, that run is, is oh, so so difficult. Um my, my, yeah, my fear with Leicester and Man City back to back is the goal difference. We could get absolutely mullered from those two if if they're on it and they go up against Emil Kraft and people like that, mate, we could be absolutely destroyed. It's true, and, and it's confidence as well, because you look at those last yeah. two games of the season where you've got to play Sheffield United at home or Fulham, Fulham away. If yeah. you've got battered the weeks beforehand, the confidence level would be where we going into those games to think, well, if we desperately need something for this, are the players going to be... Not not are they up for it, because I, I, would, I would imagine they'll be up for it, but their confidence in front of goal, their confidence with defending, with making mistakes. If if that's happened in those weeks before, and mm. does that carry over? Uh, and does but, that nervousness kick in? But that is the thing. And, and we've seen this Newcastle team be bereft of confidence for most of the season. Now, as I mentioned there before, we're going to come on to the Villa now, mate. This game would have meant nothing if if the Villa couldn't beat Fulham. And and we'll look at Fulham fixtures after after we talk about the Villa. Um, because they're not as difficult as Newcastle's fixtures. But over to you, mate. Villa v Fulham, we massively needed you to win. How did it go? Well, we very nearly put you in a in a <laughs> tricky spot, didn't we? Um, you know, for, for, for seventy five minutes, that was uh, that was appalling. Um, you know, Fulham, whether they deserve to be in, in be ahead, they were certainly the better team. Definitely. When you know the, the the ball was gifted to Mitrovic for for their goal, that was just after the hour. Um, another Tyrone Mings mistake. You know he hasn't made many in the last few weeks, so I have to give him a lot of, of credit for the way that he's he's performed. Uh, you know over over the last couple of months. Um, but it was another one where he had so much time. He didn't have to play the pass that he played. He, he scuffed it. It went straight to, mm-hmm. to, to Mitro, who, who buried it. And you're sitting there after half an hour. We we still hadn't got a shot on target. And looking, going, well, what what the hell do we do now? You know, Jack had been ruled out again. Um, after us being so positive. During the week, seeing him in training, looking at the interviews, saying yes, it was great to have him back. You know, with Dean Smith saying, you know, we'd for, we'd forgotten how good he was. Um, <laughs> an odd thing to say, but you can't how, how could you forget? How could you forget that? <laughs> uh, I just sight out of mind that sort of thing. But it, yeah. you know, it's and then to the sort of the rumor mill started a few hours before kickoff, and and there were people saying that you know he'd been ruled out, that he picked up something in training, and. There was a lot of a lot of crap flying on on Twitter between people and some really unsavoury stuff as well, which are, yeah. is just awful to see between the fan base. And you know, it, it was proved right in the end that he wasn't playing. Mm. Um, and then we just started, and it was just yeah, well, it was the same as the Spurs game. It was just flat. There was nothing there. We'd we we didn't create anything. We 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 had no I say we had no shots on target for for seventy odd minutes. Um and it was this time around it was it was the substitutions that changed the game. So you know, we're one nil down, Fulham are, are then out of the, the relegation zone. Newcastle have dropped into it and he's looking at it going, Oh, hang on. And then <laughs> you know, we give we give Smith cr- you know, criticism for for the way that he handles substitutions in games, and, and he got them spot on yesterday. You know, he he brought on on Trezeguet for um, for Amor El Ghazi, who who offered um, you know absolutely nothing again, um, unfortunately for him. Hmm. Um, he brought on Keenan Davis and, and sort of changed the the way that we were playing. So we you know almost more to a a four four two. With the two the two lads up up top, and, and he really bossed it when he came in. It was it was really pleasing to see him play so well, and you know he had a hand in in one of the goals too. So, you know we we had a a first shot, at sixteen minutes from from the end of the game, um, <laughs> and then 
we had a, another chance a couple of minutes later where Trezeguet got ahead of massively wrong and it and it went I think it nearly went for a throw in. And look, you just like this is gonna be it. You know, we're gonna we're we're gonna lose one nil and it's the season's kind of just drifting now into obscurity, but it was it was then you know, that mantra as a gay again, he just he, he looked lively when he came on, he was into everything and he just yeah, he was like he was he was up for it, wasn't he? He, 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 had, he had a point. He had a point, didn't he? he? Had a bit of a point to prove. I think. I think he did, and and certainly Mings had one as well. You know, he he he, he made the mistake for the goal. He certainly had a massive hand in the equaliser. Um, he did. He did. You know, it was he, great. He, great pass. Yeah. He. You know. He he breaks down that left. You know. He spots the gap. He spots the 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 area to run into. Matty Target feeds him well, and then his cut back found Trezeguet. You know. It, what was it? Fifteen yards out, dead mm-hmm. centre, and he he just hit it sweetly. So that that gets us back. Um, and then it was great work from from Davis, like I say, to 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 sort of set up the the second goal again again for Trezeguet. Um, and and that gets that that impetus back in in the game. We take the lead, and we we never looked like conceding after that. I don't think Fulham created anything. No, they um, they were flat. They were flat after absolutely. that. Absolutely, mean, you got to feel for Parker, you know, and 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 Fulham, you know, because that is just your quintessential Premier League fixture right there. And then you know, for a newly promoted side who are fighting against everything, you know, to try and stay in the league, and they've been brilliant in that fight. They've been way better than we have. Um, you just I felt for Parker, even though as a Newcastle fan, I was obviously delighted, delighted that you guys were a three-one up. I felt for Parker and Fulham because I thought. You know, you don't, you don't deserve that, <laughs> you know, because it's just one of those, isn't it? You know? Yeah, no, you're right. It was, it was not. They, they, they didn't. I think the scoreline massively flattered us <laughs> in the mm. end. It, <laughs> when you look at, at that last 15 minutes, maybe one one would have been more fair. But we take your chances. You know, we had, I think it was something like five shots or four shots on target. In the end, three three of them went in. So you you know yeah. you take it. The like I said, the subs worked. Um, it sort of gives us an, another option now. Does that, you know, having mm-hmm. Davis and Watkins as a two up front, does that give us more of a a second plan if if sort of plan A doesn't work? Um, it's 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 amazing. It's amazing to think what a young player could do to add fresh impetus into your team. Cough, cough. If you're listening, Mister Bruce, might be worth a roll of the dice now and again. <laughs> well, it's it's funny that you know Davis gets some some stick. At, you know, he hasn't scored a a goal in 50 plus games so as a striker he's not he's True. not doing the job that you'd expect him to do now you know you caveat that by saying that most of those games are a substitute appearances late on when we're just yeah either desperate for something to happen or wasting time with, with the changes so but he, he made a big difference yesterday so that was really pleasing to see um, and he's and he's young and he's young mate. He's going to get better and better. It's, it's all good experience from really, isn't? It? So. But you just you just want him to kick on a little bit. You know, he's been he's been around the, that first team for for so long now, and mm. he's never really had the chance to kick on because he's never had the game time. So hopefully, this just gives him, you know, Smith a little bit of yeah. I can I can I can do something. I can make a difference and give me more time. So yeah, fingers well, crossed. That's- that's exactly it, mate. But, you know, as we say, it was a shame for Fulham. But, you know, just as we looked at the Newcastle fixtures before, we look at the Fulham fixtures here as well. So, I mean, obviously, that, that was a chance for them to get something. And, and, you know, and sadly, they didn't get it. But just looking at their fixtures moving forward compared to ours. So, they've got Wolves at home next. Now, Wolves, we've said in the last part as well, they're not the same team without Jimenez. And, the, you know, that's a winnable game for Fulham. You know, you've got to look at these next next five games. Can Fulham get points to get those three points to get them out of that <laughs> out of that bottom three spot where they are right now? Then they've got Arsenal away. Arsenal very patchy. Chelsea at home again. You know Chelsea have been great, but West Brom showed they can be got at. And then they've got Burnley um, at home, and then they've got Southampton away. So I mean, they've got a lot easier fixtures, I think, in that that little uh, kind of glut there than Newcastle have when you start factoring in Liverpool, City. You know, Leicester. What would you say? 
Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think I mean it, the old cliche of no game's easy in the Premier League, but mm-hmm. when you look at position of of the teams that they're playing against, absolutely, Fulham have the have the far easier running in in that, in that regard. You'd, you'd you know you said before and we've said we've said on previous ones that Wolves just don't look the same team without that you know without him and as up front that just being yeah. that, that focal point and but they've you know they've been they've been beaten again tonight but they showed a bit a little bit of character um Fabio Silva scored so does that give him a little bit of a boost in confidence to go on it and maybe score mm, a few more Still a good side. They're still a very good side. They're just lacking that killer edge without without him in there. I think. Yeah, the, 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 there's a little bit of a flatness to them as well. You know that mm. that that first goal tonight when you look at it and it you you've watched Lingard run for 40, 50 yards. Nobody's took got anywhere near him, and and that kind of yes. sums up their, their season a little bit where they've they've just not really been at the races that the whole whole year they've they've ticked along, so they're not in any trouble, but. They've never really looked like getting in into a run to to make a challenge on the on that top mm. half. But I think maybe just, a fresh I think maybe a freshen up for them on the cards, maybe a new manager. I, I don't think they'll look at a new manager. I think, you know, who knows he got huge amounts of uh, of of credit there to he's got to, isn't he, for what he's done in the that. club. And yeah. it's not it's not like they're they're threatened with relegation. It's you know, it's not mm. like they've had so much of a drop off that that, that you know they're right down the bottom, you know, like Sheffield United, and they're missing their their their, their main man. They you know they they sort of obviously sold Jota. Um, they're mm, missing they Jimenez. Can't. Yeah, they're, they're huge players to to you know try and replace. But maybe it's a, a summer of of just building again for them so they can get back to to sort of aiming at, at those European spots again. Yeah, definitely. So, so kind of just to close off the the club corner, uh, mate. I think that with Newcastle, again, that yeah, it was a great point as we said. But for me, nothing's changed. We're still in the mire. Um, I've kind of resigned myself to the fact now. I don't think Bruce is going anywhere uh, till the end of the season. So this is a lot, um, and we've just got to hope that we've got enough to to get what we need. Um, I think it's going to really rely on other teams beating Fulham as opposed to us beating other teams. But the the, the biggest fixture for me is next weekend. If we don't beat Burnley, a point's not good enough for me. We need the three points against Burnley. And if we don't get it, I think we're, we're very, very uh, much a danger of going down. Yeah, I, I think you're right. With that, with that run of games afterwards, that three points has to be a, um, a must next week. We're, yeah. If you Absolutely. don't win that, I, you, you fear that when you get through those next three, then you could very well be sitting in that bottom three. Oh, absolutely, but time will tell. So for now, we'll leave the club corner and we'll move on to the next section. OK, so it's weekly roundup time. This is the part of the show where we go through what's been going on with the, the weekly results in the game. So starting off with the World Cup qualifiers on Tuesday, we had uh, Wales taking on Czech Republic, 1-0 to the Welsh. It was a great result. Uh, Wednesday, we had England taking on Poland, uh, Lewandowski-less Poland. England winning 2-1, so that was a good result. Northern Ireland drew with Bulgaria, a good result for Northern Ireland. Scotland beat the mighty Faroe Islands 4-0 with two goals from uh, your man John McGinn, one from little wee man Ryan Fraser and Mr McAdams himself. Bang and a goal, mate. Very good to see. So that wrapped up the World Cup qualifiers. And moving on to the Premier League's return. On Saturday, we we had a an Acker Boston result of uh, West Brom beating Chelsea five two. That's right. People will be wondering. We've, we've said Joe Linton scored and West Brom beat Chelsea five two. Yeah, there's something wrong with the airwaves. Uh, mental result. We had Leeds beating Sheffield United two uh, one. Leicester Man City. Uh, that was two nil to Man City. A real professional result for them. Gets them one step closer to the title. Uh, Arsenal taking on Liverpool. Liverpool nice easy three nil win. Um, Diego Jota with a double, which we'll come on to him in a second. And then we moved into Sunday. We had uh, a game that I called could be a bit of a flip-flop on the preview on the blog, and I was completely wrong because it ended up being 3-2 <laughs> with Southampton coming back to, to win the game, which was a brilliant a brilliant performance. We've covered Newcastle and Spurs, which was twos each. Uh, again, we've covered Villa and Fulham, 3-1 to the Villa. Then we wrapped up the weekend with uh, Manchester United beating Brighton 2-1. 
and it was a Manchester United Academy reunion with Danny Welbeck, Rashford and Greenwood all banging in the goals. Very good for Manchester United's Academy. So that was the, the weekly roundup and results. Going to the talking points, mate, um, there was a bit of a dodgy penalty incident at Chelsea. I'm not sure it would have saved them, but what was your take? Yeah, I think when you you, you sort of look at, at the incident, I think it was was Werner who was was fouled as he was was crossing the ball. The, the, the ball had left him, and the, the the West Brom player I can't remember who it was now. It had just gone through his foot just as as he played it, and, and and nothing was given. And then you saw exactly the same incident in the Southampton game, um, where it was Kyle Walker Peters. Um, foul, and and the penalty was given. It was I think that was on Eric Peters, um, and it was exactly the same. You know, Peters cuts the ball across after the ball's gone. Walker Peters goes through his foot, and it's given as a penalty. And you just you just cry at the consistency no, or no. lack of consistency so because yeah. so frustrating. Both, mate. both the penalties and and Chelsea fans must be be screamed because that. It's one of those where does that? It might not have changed the game, but at the at the point in which that happens, it's such a huge thing to not go your way, and and that's not going to be the reason that they lost the game, but that could very well have been if that's given and they score it. Is that the reason that they go on to to win the game rather than than lose it? So it was a it was a huge huge miss, I think. Um, mm. Like I say, it's just it's that consistency level where you you see one given and one not, and they're the same incident. And it's just come on. Mm. If the ref isn't seeing it, VAR should be looking at going, yeah, that's clear. That that's a clear and obvious, yeah, um, ever that, that that's been made. You, you've got to wonder again. We've said it before. What what is the point of VAR if not to do those kind of um, you know responsible decisions and say, you know, this is a bit of a grey area. Let's have a look at it again. The replay. Yeah, it's a stonewall penalty. But the worst thing about this game, it's got people asking the questions, and you as well, mate, asking the question, can Sam Allardyce do it? And I don't want him to do it. Not because I don't like West Brom. I loathe the man. Do, do you really think they've got a chance? Well, you, we said that there's absolutely no way that they can, that they could, could even consider getting back into this as it goes, but you know, all of a sudden that that gap is what eight points now. No. It's you know it's it, it was a little bit it was a little bit more than that before. You just tell me about it. There's, there's only eight games left, so you know the the, the amount of time that they've got is is tiny. Mm. But they still they've still got what twenty four points to to play for now and. The gap, the gaps eight, it's it's not beyond the realms of possibility. And looking at their games, you know they've got Southampton next. Um, they've got Leicester and Villa both away from home. Then they've got Wolves. You know, there's some big sort of Midlands games in there. And then they they go to Arsenal and and they finish up um, at home to Liverpool, at home to West Ham, and then away to Leeds. And it Mm. Yeah, they could they could quite easily pick up eight or nine points in that first run of five games if if they play like they did on on Saturday and all of a sudden that's that's the cat amongst the pigeons because it's not just Fulham and Newcastle that are battling for that last place. It suddenly drags in well, potentially Brighton, potentially and, and then West Brom as well. So it's back mm. to being two from four, not not one from two. So can they? Yeah, you know we've we've said for weeks that the, there's no chance. Like I say, and, and mm. all of a sudden you're just going, hang on, that they're, they're just are they making this at the right this run at the right time now? Is this suddenly then? Could you could you imagine how smug Allardyce oh, would look God. if he, if he does it? But I still I still think just to finish our West Brom, I still think it would be the best resurrection since Jesus came back if they were to get out of the position that they're in now. Made it straight. So mo- moving on to the, um, another talking point. You wrote a great article about this a while ago. And, and to be fair, we had some good engagement with Liverpool fans as well on Twitter about uh, Bobby Firmino. He came back to the side. Um, again, didn't really do a great deal. 
But Diego Jotler again was the man. And, and for me, he's, he's got to start over Bobby. He has to. He's just, for me, he just hasn't been good enough, has he? I just, I Jotter just offers so much more than, than Firmino has all season. It's just, he, he doesn't offer us, offer us, offer, offer Liverpool very much. I've suddenly switched allegiances there. <laughs> um, I, I don't support Liverpool. I just, all right, mate. Calm down, calm down. Dear me. Um, no, he, he just doesn't do anything. You know, it, it's so telling how much of a difference, you know, there is when he, when, when Jota plays and yeah, it, it suddenly, it suddenly means that there's more, there's more freedom for the others. And, you know, not to liken it to the, to the Grealish situation, but you put somebody in there that, that attracts a little bit more attention and there's less attention on some of the other players. You know, Jack will pull two or three players towards him, and suddenly there's there's freedom there for for the others. Likewise, with with Jota there, that defenders know they're in for more of a battle against him. And I think they do against Firmino, so mm. they'll maybe you know focus their attention on on Jota, but they haven't got the same then attention on Mane and and Salah, which frees those those guys up to be able to. To, to sort of start scoring and creating things again, so that might be the that might be the key now for Liverpool in the running, especially you now they they're sort of chasing down that fourth place. That he he might be the that that key now back in the team, back in form, and and getting them getting them on their way. Absolutely, you know he looks every inch a Liverpool player, I must say. And and just to finish off the the Whitney roundup and the talking points. We mentioned it a little bit before. Um, it was kind of more surrounded by the doom and gloom of my team. But, you know, Harry Kane, he's absolutely on fire for club and country this season. He's so invaluable for both. And you really got to wonder if he doesn't win anything this season and Spurs don't finish top four. And, you know, you just said it there, West Ham have won again tonight. They're back in the top four. Spurs are out. Is Harry Kane going to stay or is he going to go? It's a tough one, isn't it? Because... While they're while they're in and around those Champions League spaces, you you you, you sort of suggest that he, he might stick around. That, that you know they're in a cup final, that they've still got a play. So could they could they win a trophy? Will that appease him? But if they don't make the top four, I just you kind of sit and wonder whether he's just wasting wasting his time there because. <laughs> He's got so much more to give. His his goal record is absolutely phenomenal, and you know we 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 sort of touched on it with, with the piece about the the strikers, which we'll come on to later. But is you know he's is he? I think he's got the the best goals per game ratio as of kind of we're, we're top ten now with those two goals um, against Newcastle that that just puts him a. Slightly ahead of of Henri now in in, in goals per game, mm-hmm. and, and he's he he's such a good striker, and he needs he needs to be playing a team that's that's fighting for championships, yes. fighting for trophies, fighting for the Champions League. It just it it's crazy when you think of it. He could be another one that plays out his career at one club. And he's almost wasted by it because, yes, it's his club, and I absolutely admire that that you you stay and you you try and you win win for your for your team. But if you go question that, he, he should be in a in a in a side that is that is fighting for that top spot, and and it just doesn't look like Spurs are going to do that anytime soon. Absolutely, mate. Absolutely, but it's a great segue to the next section, mate, which we are going to. We'll talk about the who's the greatest Premier League striker ever. So let's get stuck into that now. Okay, so it's article review time, and uh, I'm very excited about this one, mate. Uh, the, the The news of Sergio Aguero leaving the Premier League at the end of this season sparked a huge debate. Uh, you did a couple of great articles, one about Sergio Aguero himself, who's a phenomenal player. Um, but there was a lot of noise coming out, especially on social media for the you know the, the modern day supporter who seems to think the Premier League's only been about six or seven years old and forgets about the, the players that have been and gone. 
uh, who said Sergio Aguero was the greatest Premier League striker ever. Utter nonsense, in my opinion. Complete nonsense. And it isn't just because I'm a Newcastle fan. It's because I'm a football fan and it's just it's stupid. Uh, you did a great article on uh, actually the top 10 strikers, not just in terms of the quality, but statistically as well. And uh, We've narrowed it down to the top four. And uh, coming in at number four, uh, he's actually number two on the all-time goal scored record list at 208 goals in 48, well, 482 games. And that's Wayne Rooney. He won five titles, 103 assists. Uh, his goal per game, I think, was 0.43. And his uh, goal contribution was 0.64. Wayne Rooney, what a phenomenal player, son. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he's to, that number of games, that number of goals, it's just... He was a great, great player, and you know he's he wasn't your your stereotypical number number nine striker that that maybe he's a, a Guerrero sort of played as, and certainly the, the likes of Shearer played as. But as a forward, um, he he made so many goals and 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 still scored an absolute bucket load, and you know he deserves to be in that in that top bracket. You know he 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 has his he has his detractors. I, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> why? <laughs> but he's, you know, he he, he has won, won five titles. He, he's won the most out of any of those 10 strikers. And, you know, Absolutely. I'm, not, I'm not yet counting this season is over for Aguero. So that will be five for him as well. But True. he's just, yeah, Rooney was just, he was a phenomenal footballer. So it's just, he, he, yeah, absolutely deserves his place there. Hundred percent, and the closest anybody's came yet to uh, to, to break that all time goal scoring record. So, so tell us who's at number three. So three was was Aguero. Um, you know, it, the argument I, I've seen a, a lot on on sort of social media over the last week or so that you know he is the the, the best you know best goals per game and things. And even looking at look looks get those stats. I think he has the best goals per minute ratio. Um, mm. The way I looked at this was just goals per games played and, and, and it wasn't taken into account number of minutes played. So I'm probably doing him a little bit of a disservice there, but he's still a phenomenal striker. 181 goals and 272 appearances, 46 assists. I say he's got four four Premier League titles, soon to be five. Um, mm. uh, utterly utterly staggering the 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 number of of goals that he, he scored in that in that number of games when you you know you consider it, putting them up against Rooney and and that's that's like comparing apples and oranges isn't it but it is two four players to to have 181 and 272 and he's only 27 behind Rooney and he's played <laughs> 210 less games it's, it's yeah, incredible. He's, it's a, he's a phenomenal really. forward. It is. I mean, I mean, you know, he's been in a fantastic team as well. It's got to be said, you know, under a great manager. But uh, I mean, he, ha- he has been a, an absolute revelation, Aguero. You know, and he, he rightly so takes his takes his pride of place in in that top four of greatest ever strikers. So, kind of moving on to number two. Um, you know, this is a player who I think, you know. When the, when the pubs are open, oh God, when the pubs are open and we all sit and have a pint and talk about our greatest Premier League team, this man is definitely in there and it's Thierry Henry. 175 goals in 258 games, two Premier League titles, 74 assists. Um, i seen a great line on Twitter that said, Alan Shearer is the best goal scorer the Premier League's ever seen and Thierry Henry is the best player the Premier League's ever seen. And do you know what? Can't really argue with that because just what what a player! Yeah, I, I think I've overused the word phenomenal um, today, but <laughs> yeah, he, he was he, he was. I think I'd agree with that line. I think Thierry Henry is the best player we've seen in the Premier League. He was just all around, all around. Yeah, just what a what a player! He had absolutely everything about his game. You know, he he, he was quick, he was skillful. He, he could pass the ball. He could, his finishing was just incredible. Um, his he is as close to uh, you know getting a goal contribution per game across mm. two hundred and fifty eight games in the Premier League. No point was no point nine six. No point so nine six a game. So close to being what a contribution. So it's a goal or assist every mm. game 
game. Do, do, do you think that's because he used to be a winger? He was a converted winger. Do you think that's why he was so good at creating goals? Because he was a winger? I just think it was a, maybe a little bit of that, but I think it was just in and around that, that whole team at that point. Mm. They That Arsenal side were, were brilliant. You know, he was playing alongside the, the likes of Burkamp, but what a, what a front two oh, to, God, to have. Yeah. You know, it just... And, and they made each other's goals and and he'd, he'd put them on the plate for anybody else. You know, they, they're playing with the likes of, of Ovo Mars and, and Freddie Lundberg. And it's just, yeah, I, you look back and so so fond, fondly at that that, that era of, of Arsenal. <laughs> Compare it to now, you just think, oh, oh man. And, um, um, any, any Arsenal fans, apologies for that walk down memory lane. You're all crying probably now and <laughs> thinking of hap- happier times if, you, if you're old enough to, to remember it. But uh, yeah, Thierry Henry was just a, you know, for us to be able to watch him at a time as well where we could really enjoy and appreciate football, you know, like, like, like we did, you know, just, just a blessing really for, to watch a player like that at, at the peak of his powers. Went to Barcelona and it didn't look out of place either, did he? Let's be honest with you. Just a phenomenal player. And to prove a completely unbiased, um, who's number one, mate? Um, well, you're, you're not unbiased, but no, I, I think given he, he holds the outright goal scoring record in the Premier League, he played 441 Premier League games for for his for the sheer number of goals that he scored and, the, and his longevity. It has to be Shearer that's number one and that's that's coming from me, you know. I'm a I'm a Villa fan. He was the scourge of Villa so many times. Um, <laughs> hated hated coming up against Newcastle with him in the team because you it was. I mean, Villa's record against Newcastle was shocking. Anyway, it still is. But you just looked at that team and just thought, how oh, the hell are we going to get anything from from this? Because he just he's a machine. Um, a leader, a leader as well, an absolute abs- leader. Absolutely right. You know, his, his his goals per game isn't isn't up there with the, with the likes of of Omri and Aguero, but it, it's not far off. You know, he's sitting at 0.59, so it's still an unbelievably good good score and record. Um, and in that sort of era as well, where players weren't given the same amount of protection. You know, the, he was playing in in the early mid nineties, where you know defenders were allowed to go through you a little bit, and <laughs> yeah, you, you do think if he hadn't had those two two sort of major injuries, what that goal record could have could have been. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just you think we missed best part of two seasons out of him, didn't we? I think it was. So could that? have been 300 plus um, you know it's it's always look, look back and think what could have been but he's he was just he was an unbelievable striker and great to watch when he wasn't playing against your team and yeah I think for me he absolutely deserves to be number one 100% you know I mean I've seen this ridiculous um, <clears throat> comment and line going around social media again a main culprit oh no Shira she, she, all he did was score goals and you think well okay really it's, it's kind, kind, of, it's kind, of, <laughs> kind of part of the job description really but I mean you know you know, you, you look at Shira and you, you think about those goals I mean I think when you think of Alan Shira that Everton goal jumps out of you straight away and that just typified Alan Shira everything that he was you know the power just and the, the ability just to grab a game by the scruff of the neck and say no we're not losing this because I'm just, telling you, we're not losing it. You know, so he just bullied, bullied defenders. He did it oh, was so, man. so, so strong and powerful, and mm-hmm. he, he read it so well. Uh, you know, before he got those injuries, the, the, those runs into the channel to to pull defenders away, mm. just find his his movement to get back in the box, and then and, and just win the number of headers that he he did. His shooting power was unreal. Um, oh, but, it was a monster. But you look at things like that, the, you know, the volley against Villa, and <laughs> yeah, uh, it's um, he, he had that in his locker as well. It's just yeah, absolutely phenomenal player, and I've used but, phenomenal but, again. Uh, you have that's the word of the day, that mate. But uh, to be honest with you, you know, people say that about Shira going back to that line. He just scores goals, sixty-four assists, you know, and and then goals created per game. It was up at zero point seven three. So I mean, 
for me, to be fair, he wasn't just a goal scorer. You know, he created chances too. Um, you know, for a large part of his Newcastle career anyway. I mean, yes, his early Blackburn career he had Wilcox and uh, Ripley either side whipping balls and as was the style of play then, you know. Didn't have people like De Bruyne slipping through balls to him and things like that, you know. So he didn't have the service that, you know, an Aguero's had these days. Um, you know, in, in Newcastle, yes, he had Ginola, Gillespie, and then, you know, Solano and Robert, but for large chunks of his Newcastle career, he had very poor service. So as you rightly say, that 260 could have been a hell of a lot more, you know, if, if he'd had better service. But yeah, yeah, I'm happy with that top four. What about you, mate? <laughs> Well, it was my top four, so yeah, no, it was <laughs> well, you, absolutely. I mean, you, you, and sit, sit and look, and, and I said we've we've sort of given little mentions to to maybe some of the others in that list as well. And I know you picked out a yeah. couple of others. I think the closest to, to getting into that group is is Harry Kane, um, mm. who who I put in at, at five. And again, you you look at that goal record. You know, 162 goals now in 238 appearances. That's unbelievable. Incredible. Um, it's incredible, isn't it? He, and, and again, no disrespect to Spurs, mate. He's not in a team where he's getting people like De Bruyne passing balls to him and stuff like that. You know, he's you know, he's got to make a lot of his own chances. Yes, he's got Son in that now. You know, but he's he, for a large part part of his career, he's he's not had a great deal of service, really. Well, he's had. You know? I mean, he's had Ericsson um, and, and players yeah. of that, but. He does a lot of the work himself, you know. He, he does. He creates a lot for himself, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. He make yeah. he makes those runs to make it easier for for players yeah. to give him the ball. Um, it's just his strike rate's incredible. You know, I think oh. it, it, over the weekend it did tick up to be, in terms of goals per game, the the best of of that top ten. Um, so he he, he just just. You know, very narrowly gone ahead of of Henri in that in that regard, but it's just yeah, you know, I think he'll he'll be the one if he does stay in the Premier League that that may challenge that that two sixty record. Um, yeah, totally, totally agree with that. It's um, it remains to be seen whether he whether he does, you know, if see what where Spurs do end up and and if he goes elsewhere, it's tough to to think of him at another Premier League team. You know he is a he is a Spurs lad, so will will he go elsewhere in in the league? But mm. it would be be interesting to see. But yeah, he's he, he's the one I think the only one really that that I think could get anywhere near it. I mean, it, it was it was an unbelievable top ten. Anybody who's not read the article, you know, go over to our our website. You know, the uh, Slide Road Pass blog. Um, you can find us on Twitter on there. Um, you know, and, and you'll see, you know, Mark's list of ten strikers, some unbelievable players. But there was two players that you didn't even put in your your great your top ten, and I, I thought they deserved a special mention just for being absolute goal machines. Um, Andy Cole and Robbie Fowler, <laughs> mate, you missed them completely, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, well, I, they they were in part, part part of my consideration. I think I had a list of about twenty. Um, you did. You were turning your hair on me. Just going remember, through, yeah. and and it it came down to. To sort of a a choice of 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 goals scored, longevity with it as well. You know, when you look at, at the likes of Shearer and Rooney over 400, 400 games, and the goal contributions, and I think for Cole and um, certainly for for Fowler as well, you you look at the their goal per game ratio wasn't quite as good. Um, no, and no, they were. They tailed off, didn't it, towards the back end of the, their career? They did, yeah. yeah, and I think I always had that thing in my, in my head with, with Andy Cole that he needed so many more chances to just to score, and that was always the criticism of him, and it was definitely a criticism of him when he when he got sort of into the England squad as well that mm. he, he didn't score frequently enough in terms of mm. chance per chance, um, so he, he kind of lost his opportunity there and. You know when he Cole, Cole, for... need, Cole needed needed somebody with him, didn't he? he? Needed Beardsley or needed York. He needed somebody with him. I think Cole. Yeah, and he and he needed a hat full of chances each game. And yeah, and you're at, right. At Newcastle in that side and 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 at Man United at the time, he he was getting you know six, seven, eight chances a game, in which he would score one. You know one, two, three. He, he, if he had a if they had a quiet game and he didn't get the chances. 
I always felt he struggled. And, and that wasn't really, that didn't really play into my thinking with the list. It was more about his, his sort of record of, a, of his, his goals um, per, per game or goal contributions per game as well. And this, the same for Fowler, as, as brilliant as Fowler was and as, yeah, as sort of natural as a as a, a finisher as, as he was, he just again I think you're right. It tailed off towards the end and, and just didn't score as many in, in his la- his later years that that probably harm harm that record as, as such. So mm. I don't think if you put Fowler in in the modern day game now with the the professionals and the diets, you know, the sports psychologists, I think Robbie Fowler scores a lot more goals and stays leaner and fitter. A lot more, you, you know, you, you saw towards the back end of his time at Liverpool, even, you know, he looked a bit top heavy, didn't he? You know, he, he was still so skillful, you know, and he could score a goal like no other. Um, you know, and he didn't need, need much of a chance, but he wasn't mobile. He wasn't kind of moving with the game, the way the game was heading. So I think that's kind of what put the put the brakes on Fowler a bit. Maybe. Uh, yeah, you've got to think it as well. You, if you put him in a, in a Premier League side now, as he was back then, Oh, if wow, he's playing God, with, yeah. with, with a De Bruyne or somebody like that, the number of goals he oh, would score would, would would be would be incredible. So, but no, honorable, just yeah. honorable mentions for those two. You know, with the the last of my, the that top ten was was Suarez, Van Persie, Van Nistelrooy, Jimmy Floyd, Hasselbank, and Jamie Vardy. So yeah, great players, just, great players. It was it was like I say, it was a, a choice of ten ten from. From twenty, so it was narrowing it down, and it was it was it's really good to kind of go back and and have a look back over over some of the the histories as well. So the nice uh, nice thing to do, absolutely, and uh, it's great to have our say in the debate. And any of the young guns who think we're talking rubbish, I suggest you type in Alan Shearer goals on YouTube and there uh, go check them out. <laughs> so that's us done for this section. Mate. We're going to move on to the next one, our team of the year so far. Okay, so it's time for a new section here. And again, keeping with the, the mood of what's happening in the football world at the moment, it's that time of the year, the business end of the season, where you start looking at who's been the best players you know, in the league this season and, and the team of the year. So everyone's got their opinion and uh, we've come up with ours, mate. So uh, our team of the year, uh, as you're the resident goalkeeper and given who the goalkeeper is, I'm uh, passing this over to you. Crack on. I get accused of bias here as well. So, um, no, I mean, for me, it, it kind of it's sort of a straight choice between two, but I went for, for Martinez from Villa. Um, just, I mean, what a difference he, he, he sort of made to that, that Villa back line. And he just gives a, a huge amount of, of, of consistency. It allows the, that, Defense to be so much more calm. Um, he, he he catches virtually everything. I, I haven't seen a, I haven't seen a goalkeeper do that in a long time, and he, he's far more comfortable with catching a ball than he is trying to punch it. And so many goalkeepers these days are, are just the first instance is is just to punch it away. Um, but you know he's he's fourteen clean sheets in in twenty nine games. It's, He's he's nearly got the the record for Villa in a in a season uh, for for clean sheets, but he's just been he's been what a signing. Um, I think I said this a few podcasts ago that Arsenal letting him go just seems madness, <laughs> and we've got a we've got a bargain. Um, I think you know, so. It set us back twenty million, but that seems cheap. When by the season, by the season for me, mate, absolutely. Maybe yeah, you know when you you know you consider how much the likes of Kepa was, was bought for at Chelsea, and you think well, just you know twenty million for, for and and yes he was was slightly slightly unproven in, in the fact that he hadn't played much beforehand. He had that great run at the end of last season for for Arsenal, but what a sign and what a goalkeeper and you know he's he's just made such a huge difference to that that Villa defence. Yeah, he's been fantastic, mate. Great reflexes, shot stopping, you know, uh, just kind of reading as well. Uh, I think everything you want in a goalkeeper, and, and you say for 20 million quid is an absolute snip. So in front of him as a defence, um, we've got a, a Manchester City three of their back four here. So we've got uh, 
Joe Cancelo, uh, Ruben Diaz and John Stones and Man City have been brilliant this season and, and those three as part of that back four have only conceded 21 goals this season. Just amazing, that, isn't it? It is. I think, well, you, you kind of consider they, they were they were quite rocky to start with and I think it was mm. before, obviously before Diaz came in and he's made such a huge difference to that, to that back right. line and and seems to have brought the best out of Stones as well. So it's nice to see that, that Stones is back to the form that he, he had before. Um, Cancelo's been far and away the best right back in the league um, th- this season. He, he's so consistent. Um, and, and they've, you know, they've, they've kind of got, got two there and, and sort of Kyle Walker as well that is, is very, very good too. But I think Cancelo is, is head and shoulders uh, above Absolutely nice. I think he's the best right back in Europe, arguably at the moment. You know, and I mean John Stones as well, just a point on him. I think he's chipped in with about four, four or five goals already as well this season. And with John Stones, he always has that. And he's got a goal in his locker, a bit a bit almost like John Terry used to be able to do. Um, but he's he's got kind of got more composure, a bit like a real third man. So I think, yeah, it's great to see John Stones come back from being written off by so many people. Again, credit to Pep Guardiola and credit to Stones, you know, for putting themselves back. And speaking of coming back from the brink. Our left back, we're staying in Manchester. I know you're a big fan of this guy. Luke Shaw gets the nod of left back for us, mate. Yeah, you know, you, you think back a few years ago, he was he was talked about as being, you know, he's the next Ashley Cole. I, I kind of hate that kind of phrase. He's the next <laughs> somebody. You no, know, he's the, he's the first one of himself, and yeah, he, he was just so good when he when he sort of came from Southampton and and, and then started at, at United. It, Unfortunately, sort of form, and then injuries kind of robbed him a little bit, and it's taken a while for for him to get back, sort of in the in the side. I know Jose wasn't a, a big fan of him, was he? And but it seems like he he sort of found found his home again under Solskjaer, and he just looks back to his best. You know, he's 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 playing a lot. He's you know he's. He scored this season again. He's, you know, he's, he's, got, he's got five assists now. It, it just looks the the Luke Shaw that from from sort of three, four, five years ago now that is is sort of back in back at his best. Yeah, real strength of character again. <clears throat> you know, for him as a player, some of the abuse he was getting. You know, people call him fat and all that stuff. And you know, to come back from being written off by so many and, and putting in the performances that he has is. Again, it just shows you the mentality. Maybe there's a bit of maturity in that player as well, you know, kind of coming through that. He went to United at quite a young age, you know, and he's he's really kind of grown up there. And he's definitely uh, put it in for United now. So going into midfield, people are going to think we're the new uh, Gallagher brothers, mate. There's a more Mancunian presence in our midfield. <laughs> We've gone for three in midfield, all from Manchester clubs. I will let you start on, mate. Who's the first choice in midfield? So I went with with um, Ilkay Gundogan from from Manchester City. I just think his his sort of goal record, um, certainly in that sort of middle spell of the season, where he, he seemed to score every every single game, and he's just again another one that's just flourished this season and, and, and made that that City side or got that City side to to where they are. And there, you know, mm. he's one of the one of the many reasons that they are they are flying at the top of the league, but. He's just been absolutely phenomenal this season. Absolutely, and and the next one we had a bit of a we had a bit of a red debate about you and I, didn't we? That's um, Bruno Fernandez. I mean, there's no question. You know, 16 goals in in 30 games, 11 assists in the Premier League. Everything seems to go through him for Manchester United. But you know, you can question. Um, I suppose is his contribution in the big games. I know you wanted to make a point about this. I think he's a great player. He's definitely improved Man United. There's no question. We we sung his praises when we had the Pogba debate a couple of podcasts ago. But just a couple of points you want to point out about those 16 goals. Yeah, I think you're right. In the the, the argument against him is always that he, he doesn't he doesn't turn up for for big games, and it's maybe less true this season. He, he's had some good performances against the. The teams in the top six, um, but there is still a lack of goals and a lack of assists in, in some of those games. Um, of those sixteen goals that he he has, um, you know, half of those are penalties. It's harsh to kind of take away the the credit for scoring up for those goals when they are penalties. You know, we've 
we've sort of talked about that before where you know you take away strikers goals from penalties and all of a sudden their record looks d- dreadful so he's, he's the best penalty taker he, he gets that that job you can't knock him for that but you can sort of take away those and it and it puts him back back in that that little pack of uh, sort of other midfielders that you might consider it as well so do they inflate his importance a little bit uh, there's no denying he's brilliant and he, he has made such a huge difference to to that United midfield since he joined um mm. so I, I can't I can't say that he's a, he's a bad player at all I think he fully deserves to be in in, in any discussion for team of the year and you'll always have the the backwards and forwards between United and city fans where they're, they're claiming that Bruno is better than De Bruyne and vice versa. So um, we'll we'll see where 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 my my loyalties in that lie. But you know, he, like I say, he deserves his place in this team. You know, his, his contributions this season. You know, 27, 27 goal contributions in thirty games. You can't knock that. No, you you really can't, and and you you you've said you've said the name. So last but no means least, our final midfielder at our three is none other than Kevin De Bruyne, mate. Just simply the best in the world for me right now. What, what have you got to say about Kev Brown as the Man City fans call him? Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think as a midfielder goes, that I don't think anybody's close to him in terms of of the best in the world. Um. You know, maybe it's different positions. You you look at the players are better than him, but certainly in, in the position that he plays, that there is nobody like him. Um, it, it just special. I think that's you know the one word that you can use to describe me. Just he just creates things. He's he's always wanting the ball. His passing, his delivery, his crossing is it's unbelievable. Um, he has. You know, a huge eye for a goal, less so this season, but, um, you know, a number of assists. It's, you know, he's still got got 11 in, in 24, but <laughs> he's, he's yeah. sort of, I think he's he's kind of, I've seen people use the, the, the term pre-assist, which I absolutely hate because um, <laughs> it's nothing. But if you look at that, how many of, of, of City's goals are, made by something that De Bruyne has done, whether it's exactly. the pass before an assist or two passes yeah. before that, that caused trouble. And he's just, yeah, he, he's a wonderful, wonderful footballer and he is, he, just he's, a joy he's a great, to watch. He's a great player. I think the the funniest line I heard to describe De Bruyne at the, at the weekend um, was Jamie Redknapp said, I've never seen anyone pass the ball like him. He passes the ball like Paul Scholes. And that's just a little general reminder to the listeners that if anyone wants to read Mark's piece on shite pundits, it's still up on the blog site. For anybody that obviously you can't see me right now, I am banging my head off the desk. <laughs> Jamie Redknapp, ladies and gentlemen. So moving on from Jamie Redknapp to um, a current Liverpool great. Um, so we have our front three and we're kicking it off with, with Mo Salah, even though Liverpool have been a bit ropey this season. Salah's still been the man, hasn't he, mate? Yeah, he's you know he, I think it, it kind of people had sort of written him off. I, I think even I've said at one point that I don't think he was quite the same player this season. And but he's still scoring goals. Um, he's <laughs> he's still got eighteen goals this season. You know, in in, in a I'd love to say a Liverpool team that's struggling, given where they are in the league. You know, yeah. they've still got that chance of being in the in the in the top four. He's just again, he he's a brilliant footballer and. You know he's he's shown over the last couple of seasons just just what he you know what he's worth to to that team, um, and he's doing it again this season. In, all by it quietly, he's not quite to kind of hit the headlines that he's that he's done maybe he's over the last couple of years, but phenomenal. Mm, absolutely, doesn't like to pass the ball, does he? Three assists. <laughs> he likes to score goals. Doesn't like to create them. <laughs> no, he's he's he's, he's that kind of selfish striker and or, or forward, Ronaldo. and he just yeah. yeah. But if you're going to score the number of goals that he does as regularly as do, as he does, you 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 can't knock him for not passing the ball. I know he gets grief. There was that that bit with with Mane was that last season where there was a little bit of a grump on between the two of them, but. Honestly, man, if he 
you put put a strike like that in in any team. If he scores that rate of goals, he can do what he wants, basically. Absolutely. And on the left hand side of uh, of our front three, because we had a bit of a wiggle around with our midfield, uh, we had to insert him here. But I think he could play anywhere. There's no other person better qualified to talk about this guy than you, Captain Jack. Take it away. Yeah, you know, again, it's a little bit of bias in here, possibly, but you know, he's. 22 games, you know, this season he's he scored six goals. He's got got ten assists. Um, he just can controls so much of, of Villa's attack and play. He draws players towards him. Um, he allows the other players to to sort of find space and, and, and he puts things on a plate for people. His, his weight of pass is, is phenomenal. He glides when he dribbles. You know, he, I think one of the, the criticisms w- w- over the last couple of seasons has been, you know, he's not quick. I think he was... when it, they, need they, to be. No, but, <laughs> but he is. And, and this, I think it's deceptive. You know, I think mm. they did some clocking of speeds of players and he was right up there at the top. You know, he he's quite deceptive in his speed. He he certainly thinks ahead of a lot of people. You know, he's always looking for that next pass before he's even got the ball. Um, you know, he keeps his head up. He's always aware of what's around him, and it's it's been very telling how good he is in the last sort of seven games that we haven't had him. Um, so. But to to still have that level of contribution in in, in that number of games is, is just brilliant, and it's, and he hasn't looked out of place when he's played for England either. So you know, he, I think we, we like you say we we had a little bit of a debate around around some of the players, and you know we'd obviously looked at, at players like Rafinha and and Patrick Bamford as well for that for that sort of front three. But I just don't think. For the level of impact that he's that he's had, that you can you can look past Jack Grealish. No, absolutely not. And for any of those who think Jack Grealish is slow, I I would invite you to come up to Newcastle United and watch Jeff Hendrick and John Joe Shelby for ten minutes in training, and uh, all of a sudden Grealish will look like the road runner. So uh, yeah, that that's slow players for you. So finishing off our front three, um, we talked about him before, and he's just you know he's just a. <laughs> to use your word, phenomenal centre forward, Harry Kane. You know, two goals of the weekends took him to 19 goals, 28 games, 13 assists. I think one thing that's been notable this season from Harry developed his game even more. He's dropping deeper, he's bringing people in. You know, he's he's almost becoming, you know, that kind of deep lion attacking player. You know, you you know, we talked about when he leaves Spurs. You could see him going somewhere like a Barcelona and providing goals for people like Messi and Griezmann, you know, if he keeps going like this, mate. Yeah, I think certainly you look at the form he had with Son earlier in the season and think, well, if he could do that with in that Spurs team, what would he be like with, you know, with the likes of maybe you look at City with, with Sterling one side, Foden the other, you, you go to Madrid and you, you can play with, with players either side at Barcelona with Messi one side. But, you know, he could, he could, fit in anywhere and, and play like that. I, I sometimes think he gets caught a little bit too deep and he likes to sometimes. come and find the ball a little bit too yeah. much. Um, which, which was something Rooney was guilty of as well, yeah. I think. And that's probably why he break that record, as we mentioned earlier. So, But I, but I, I still, I, he just, he does find his way back into the box yeah. with ease. Um, and nobody's yet found a way of really stopping him. You know, he's, he seems to keep living his game as well, which is credit to him. You know, even when people think they've got him figured out, he does something different. Yeah, he's just he he has his he you know he there, there are faults there with him. Um, we we talked about them um, last week. Um, some of the things that he he, he does that I, I you know I don't like, but you can't knock his record his his goals over the last what seven eight years have just you know it's been. Unbelievable! He's he is close to getting in that top three or four best players of of the Premier League era, or best strikers of the Premier League era. And if he keeps scoring at this rate, he's he's going to be there in no time at all. But yeah, he ha- absolutely ha- has to lead the line for for this for this team. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And it's, it's a great side we've picked. And just finishing up on Kane, I really think Spurs have got a hard job keeping a hold of them. There's some of them, there'll be some big teams in from. So just some of the notable mentions, you, you, you already kind of covered a couple of them there. I think the two guys from Leeds, Patrick Banford, 14 goals in 30 games, seven assists. I know you loathe them, but he's been great this season. Rafinha, six goals, 25, six assists. You know, two great first seasons from the Leeds guys, mate. What would you say? Absolutely, yeah. And Leeds have been been brilliant to, to watch oh, this season. And, you know, uh, yeah, I have okay, issues with Bamford, but it all stems from that from that game where he, <laughs> you know, he he feigned fe- getting hit in the in the face from from Al Ghazi and got him sent off. And it, you know, it's I think shit it's house a, is the word, mate. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. But you know, the, there's no denying how good he is. Been um, great again. You, he's he's had his detractors, and he he's he struggled before in, in the Premier League, certainly. But this season, certainly in the BL, so he's just he, he he's a different player, and yeah, I think he we may just see him get better and better over the next next season or two. Absolutely, and you know, again, just to finish off, <clears throat> one last noble mention: young Phil Foden um, from Man City. I think he's just been. Absolutely brilliant this season, and, and you know they haven't missed Avin Silva because this lad stepped up, and I honestly think this kid could be the best midfielder in the world in the next few years. I really do. He's got everything. Yeah, you know, he, he just he, he sort of broken a little bit through again this season. He, we, we did wonder a, a season or two before that quite what Pep's plan was for him, where. He wasn't being sent out on loan anywhere, but he wasn't playing. He just thought, is he is he going to be another one of those that is, has enormous talent but but never makes it because he he mm. can't break into the into the team. But he's just certainly Premier League this season and and in the Champions League as well. He's just looked at a different level. Um, it's a little bit disappointing with his, his sort of England performance over, over the last couple of weeks, but. Mm. You know, it's that's early days from playing it, it, it in that environment. So he's only, <laughs> let's say, he's only a kid. Um, you know, he is only young. He's he's got plenty of time to to grow in in, in sort of that area as well. But you you can't deny what a what a brilliant footballer he is. No, absolutely, absolutely, and look forward to seeing what he can do in the summer as well. So that's our team. We're going to post it up on the uh, on the Twitter side. For you guys to see, you know, comment below. I'm sure you guys will have uh, either guys you agree with, people you don't agree with, and uh, we'll be interested in interact with you and hear what you've got to say. So we're going to move on to the next section. Okay, so it's time to take a look at some of the upcoming fixtures for this week. So kicking off on Tuesday, what have we got, mate? Um, so yeah, Tuesday we've got um, championship games between Brentford and Birmingham City. Um, so interest at both ends of the table, um, and Norwich uh, against Huddersfield. Um, in the Champions League, we've got sort of the big ties between um, Manchester City and Borussia Dortmund, and Real Madrid versus Liverpool. Some good games there, mate. Moving on to Wednesday, we've got Bayern Munich and PSG. No Lewandowski again is the word. So that's a real bad one for Bayern. And then, then we've got the Mourinho derby of uh, Porto and Chelsea. So they're moving to Thursday, mate? Yeah, so Thursday, obviously Europa League with uh, Granada uh, at home to Manchester United, Arsenal at home to Slavia Prague, uh, Ajax uh, home to Roma and uh, Dinamo Zagreb at home to Villarreal. Some good games, mate, some good games. Friday night, we've got a Friday night game with Fulham and Wolves. Obviously, I'll be looking at that for, for the relegation picture through me fingers. And then we've got a pretty hectic weekend, haven't we, mate, on, uh, on, uh, for Premier League action, kicking off for Saturday. Yeah, so Saturday, you know, there's, th- there's three games Saturday. So Manchester City against Leeds, Liverpool against, uh, against Villa, and then Crystal Palace against Chelsea. And some decent games. And then Sunday, moving in, we've got the big game, Burnley Newcastle, which we mentioned the club corner. It's a must win for Newcastle. Uh, don't win and they're relegated, in my opinion. Then we've got West Ham, Leicester, and Spurs versus Manchester United. And then uh, Sheffield United versus Arsenal. Yeah, and then to end it, we've got Monday night's games, which is West Brom against Southampton. So, again, see how uh, how big Sam's team can continue on after that big win against Chelsea. Uh, and then Brighton against Everton, so another one that's got interest at the at the bottom of the league there. 
Absolutely. So it's a full jam-packed week of football, mate. Those Champions League ties do catch your eye a little bit, don't they? Especially that City Dortmund one there. Is your money on Haaland getting a goal? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting one, isn't it? And there were there's sort of pictures of him today, um, look, you know, looking around the stadium. So you would you'd, you'd almost put money on him getting getting one, and will will that be his destination in the summer? I know they've mm-hmm. I know City have or oh, Pep's rubbish talks about them going out and spending so much money on a striker, but you know that uh, you, you've heard managers say things like that before, and then go out and spend a fortune on somebody. So you wouldn't put it past them, and they've definitely. They've definitely got the money behind the scenes for it. Absolutely, absolutely. And a big one for Liverpool as well. I mean, it's our classical week as well, not to mention that on, on Saturday coming. And, uh, you know, we're doing a special this week on the blog where we've got a few articles about the uh, the two sides, Barcelona and Real Madrid. So that'd be a tough one, I think, for Liverpool, mate. But uh, I fancy them on that one. Yeah, they've sort of hit form, haven't they? And I think the Champions League, has helped them get back into into that little bit of form again, and you know that it's going to be an interesting game. Madrid have have played quite well recently too, so yeah, I think those ties and then the ones on on Wednesday as well. They're they're just it's we're at the business end now, aren't we? So the 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 games are, are more get more and more mouth watering, and just looking forward to looking forward to watching some some good games this week. Oh, absolutely, mate. And, you know, as always, we'll be, uh, you know, doing our reviews for the Premier League action uh, on the blog. So, guys, check it out. And, uh, you know, we'll be back with a, a pod next week to obviously go through the results. OK, mate. So that's us moving on to the last section of the show. Well, that's about our time up for this week's episode. Thanks for joining me, mate, especially with all the nonsense we've got up here, right? Well, couldn't it? Steve Bruce, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, man. It's been good again. Fantastic. Thanks, mate. And yeah, thank everyone for joining in and listening to the podcast. We hope you really enjoyed it. If, if you do enjoy this type of thing, then please click subscribe, leave a comment on your preferred podcast platform. And if you can, give us a follow on Twitter. We're at SRP blog. And you'll find all the links to the football-related articles we've referenced in this episode and, you know, basically com- uh, articles that we'll put on there on a regular basis, including some more uh, El Clasico articles coming later this week, which I think you'll all enjoy. So without further ado, I just want to say thanks for listening, guys, and see you later. Thank you very much for listening.